God reveal your presence to us this day. May the rays of your face illuminate this place as we dare to proclaim your word. And may we, your people, tell all of us we have heard. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, kids, come on up. Come on up. Come on up. I got an experiment to mess up. <laughs> I got an experiment to mess up. Woohoo! All right. So I tried this experiment at home. It's pretty good. So now I want to talk to you about the difference between wants and needs. Wants and needs. Wants and needs. Wants and needs. What are some of the things you want? What do you want? A Nerf gun. A Nerf gun. A Nerf gun that's very long. A Nerf gun that's very long. So you can shoot your brother with it. Okay, perfect. Desi, what would you like? What do you want? Yeah, to, uh, even a longer one, right? Okay. What? A machine gun. Oh, it's so a So does that one, is it repetitive? It just shoot, keeps shooting the bullets? The Nerf bullets? Okay. One of these days I'm going to bring these boys and we're going to, I don't know, can you can you borrow Nerf guns or do you have to buy them all? We got enough. We got enough. <laughs> I think we should have a Nerf gun war in between sir so, well in between services right after the first service. Yeah, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. Sure enough, yeah. people will donate. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be fun. Wouldn't that be fun? Yes. You're gonna be on my team. I'm a terrible shot. But yeah, I'm big enough. I can just run them over like that. <laughs> How are you? Okay. So what are some things that you need to do? Those are some things you want to have and want to do. But what are some things you need to do? Eat food. What are some other things that you need to do that you don't like to do? Clean your room. Yep. Eat broccoli. Yep. So here's some of this. This is a spoke and a wheel. You guys have seen this before, right? No, I haven't. No, you haven't? Okay. So let's say there's some things you want to do, like get a Nerf gun. <coughs> But you need money for that, so maybe mom and dad said, I'll work you out a deal. Hey, Isaac, come here. Want to hold something for me? No, Dad. Okay. <laughs> so a Nerf gun, and um, let's see. There's some things you need to do is to make some money for that, because mom's going to match half of it, but the other half you're going to have to do on your own. So she says, I'll pay you to clean your room, right? So this is what, you're, this is what you don't want to do, right? So what's some other things that you want to do? You want to play video games, right? You want to go shopping at thrift stores. Thrift shopping. What is happening behind me? Thrift stores. Do you need me to hold that boy? I'll hold him. Where are you? Hi. There. You good. What's up? And then, so I got to clean my room. What other chores do you have that you have to do, you need to do? You need to do homework, don't you? How many of you have homework? Don't tell me you don't have homework. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't. This week it's been optional. It's been optional homework? What is optional homework? Okay, but you have to get it done in class if you don't take it home, right? Sometimes. Do you have, have, do you have grammar spelling tests? No. Yes. Like this week at school. Oh, you had a math test? Yeah. So what did you do for that math test? Did you study? I know, you guys are so smart, you don't need to study. I do. I had math 055 in college. Remember that, you did three algebra, math 055? <laughs> That's like, you didn't do so well in high school. We need to have you have this class. Okay, so it's sometimes hard to balance these two things, isn't it? Because I really want to play video games, but I know I have to do my homework. Or I really want to play Nerf guns, but I know I need to clean my room. Or I really have to study... Um, but I really want to go to a birthday party with my friend. Birthday party, right? So it's hard to balance these things out. But God can help us balance things out if we put him in the center of our life. Help me, Jesus, not to go play video games so my mom won't scream at me about cleaning my room. Remember, this is a theme we have, right? Does any parents ever yell at you about cleaning your room? So let's say this fork represents all the things I want to do, all the things I want, all the things I want to do. And this fork, in each time, these are times. Do you know what times are? 
fork tines. Those are those little things. And the stabby things, yep. So each, each time is one of these. So here's the homework, the clean the room, the study, and here's the video games, thrift stores, buying shoes, going to the birthday party. And it can be hard to balance this out, but we have to because there's some things we want to do, but there's a lot of things we need to do. Now, this worked for me this morning. No, that's not how it's supposed to go. Please hold. Okay, so let's say this represents this circle, this world right here. And you're going to try to balance this. Do you think it's going to stay? No. <laughs> you think it's going to stay on there? Huh? No? You think it will? Oh, no, see, it's holding, yeah, that's not. It's a cup, not a candy. No, it's not going to, is it? But let's say I need God's help. Say this represents God. Do you think this toothpick can hold on and make sure our lives are balanced and stays together and balances? Do you think it Really? Why do you think that? It's a little toothpick. You think that? What science experiments have you guys been involved in? Let's watch. Watch what it does. For the video games. Oh, I really want to play the video game, but my mom's like, Can you play that camera? Okay, video games. Come on, video games. Come on, video games. Oh, but I gotta clean the room. God's gonna be like, nope. You're gonna have to clean the room first. Ta-da! Isn't that cool? Do it again. <laughs> no, I'm not going to burn the other part. That's God. I'm not burning God. No way. Okay. So, I want you to know that when you get tempted to do this stuff, but you know you have to do this, you need to do this, but you want to do this, pray to God. He will make sure that you clean your room, and then maybe your mom will give you an extra five minutes on the video games. Have you ever thought about that? If you do what mom says, she might give you a little reward. Shows responsibility. Don't touch that. It's time. Okay, touch it. I don't care. Self-correcting problem. <laughs> Isn't that what you say, Ralph? Self-correcting problem. All right. So I'm going to pray, and then I've got a choice for you guys today. I know. I've got stuff that neither, neither some of these little boys can't eat. i got cotton brownies again, and I also have fruit juice. So let's pray to remain balanced in our life. Okay? Yes. Lord, we thank you for reminding us that... In your word, it says that we should remain balanced, and the only way we can do that is through the power of your spirit that tells us what we need to do, and then, Lord, sometimes we get to even do the things we want to do. So we thank you for keeping our lives balanced so we can do both. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, you guys are going to stay up here, so you want fruit juice? Yeah? Cosmic brownie. You want an egg? You want brownie to it? How about you take those? Let me see if I got enough brownies. One, two, three, four. It's a lot of sugar. Your mom's going to hate me. You want a brownie? You want a brownie? You want a brownie? <laughs>
verse 51. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. Verse 52. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. Verse 53. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. This is the word of God. Thanks. Uh, anyways, for the people of God. <laughs> yeah. 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 Anyways. All right, I'm going to be going back and forth. Am I going to bug you? No. Okay. Yeah, you are. You're going to keep me waiting. <laughs> that's right, but sometimes I put some people to sleep. Whatever, <laughs> sleep into the house of God. That's no, the thing, right? Great. Right. So I want to ask you how you were um, taught to reverse a car, to back up a car. How were you taught? I'm going to tell you how my dad taught me, and then you just raise your hand if you think this is how you were taught to back up a car. So you get in there, you stick the thing in reverse. Yes, kids. Stick used to be up here to go reverse, right? <laughs> go reverse, and then what do you do? Put your hand on the wheel, what's the first thing you do? You look back, right? How many look back? Yeah, the women are saying yes, the men are like no. You look back, I'm used to that. My husband's here, he's gonna love what I have to say. You look back, and then you start going, and then you glance at the mirrors, right? To back up, right? Okay, when I started dating Brian, Remember that time, I don't know if it was in Childsdale or whatever, but it was summer, and I had the window unrolled, or maybe you were in the car, I can't remember. He's like, I don't remember any of this. And um, I was backing something up, and so that's, I was backing one of the cars up. He might have been in the car with me, and put it in reverse, looked over my shoulder, started backing up. I was getting to the mirrors, and what's the first thing he said? Use your mirrors. <laughs> right, men? How many men just use the mirrors? Yeah. <laughs> But you know what? You don't have to worry about any of that anymore because there's this amazing new technology called the backup camera or the reversing camera. I like to call it the great reversing camera. The great reversing camera. This is such a cool thing. It helps you to see things behind your car that you would not be able to see by just turning your head or looking in the mirrors, right? So these reversing cameras are amazing. Just FYI, they were actually started in 1951 in a centurion. Is that a Buick? Yeah. Remember those things without the mirrors on the side? I was going to show that car. It was such a cool car, but I thought the guys would just be thinking about the car and not listen to it. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, the backup camera, the lens for it, was this big. It was huge. And then it finally got smaller and smaller and smaller. So these things are amazing, these reversing cameras. So much so that the U.S. government started requiring every new car to have a reversing camera in it if it was made after May of 2018. Because it can see things behind you that you can't see with just looking back or looking at the mirrors. But get this, studies show that only 20% of drivers actually look at the reversing camera. 20%. And you know when I look at my reversing camera most is when it starts beeping. And what do you do? You argue with it. There's nothing back there but a bush, right? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? It's just a bush, right? How many yell at their reversing cameras? How many yell at them? Come on, I know you do. Or you're backing up out of Zany's, which is a thrift store up there by Acme, and it's so tight, and the road is, you know, people are going by so fast that every time you start backing up, what does it do? Beep, 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 beep. And I'm like, they're on the road. I'm in the parking lot. It's warning me that, or you're passing on the freeway, and you decide, the guy decides to speed up. Why do they always do that? They start speeding up, so now you got to speed up to get around them, and you kind of cut them a little close, but not close enough to hit them. I've been driving for a long time, right? And what does the camera do? Beep, 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 beep. And I'm like, shut up. I'm not that close to him. And he probably gives me the finger. Car. Yeah. <laughs> Fords don't do that. Fords don't do that. Well, they do. So... Anyway, so these reversing cameras, I think, are huge technology because, really, they helped to reduce deaths of children by 30%. That is why the government made them mandatory. Because there were so many accidents for people looking behind and looking in the mirrors, but they couldn't see the little ones down there. That's why you're like, it's just a bush, but it could be a little one. So why are only 20% of us looking at these things? Because we've been trained and we've been taught to look behind us and use our mirrors, right? You know what else we've been trained and taught to do? 
in this world. We've been trained and taught that the rich, the famous, and the successful are the people of power. And the weak, and the odd, and the misfit toys, and the peculiar people are not the powerful. That's what we've been taught in this world. That's what we've been trained to think about. But in our scripture reading today, and in this theme of the Gospel of Luke, we're going to see the great reversal of power is beginning with the birth of Christ. He will be ushering in the great reversal of power, where the first will become last, and the last will become first. Get it? The reversing camera? Sometimes we're blind to want to use it because we've been trained a certain way. Sometimes we are blind to the fact that God works best with weak people. Amen? God works best with who the world says is weak. God works best with the people that have special needs. God works best with the people that are forgotten. The older generation that the, that the world would say, ah, you're out to pasture. What good are you anymore? I'm now in that age. <laughs> I don't like it there. Ageism for me is a reality. Luckily, they need a lot of people to work. Otherwise, I wouldn't probably, if I had lost my job today at 56 and went out to try to get a job, especially in, with my degree that's like 100 years old, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's not 100, but it's old enough. I wouldn't be able to get it. I would, I, they would say, oh, thank you so much. No, we're going to hire the 30-year-old, right? Am I here? Yep. But God is the one who starts this great reversal in and through the birth of Jesus Christ. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're starting a new sermon series. And it is based on Ammon Hamilton's book, Luke. Jesus and the Outsiders, Outcasts, and Outlaws. So if you've ever felt like an outcast, if you've ever felt like an outlaw, if you've ever felt like an outsider, somebody who's different, somebody who doesn't um, measure up to the world standards, great! God's going to use you. And he probably already has. So we're starting this Lenten series and we're going to journey through the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Luke shows us this great reversal beginning, great reversal of power beginning. Because in heaven, it doesn't matter whether you got a million bucks or not when you were on earth, does it? And, you know, I mean, we've seen people that have had special needs that have um, become famous, right? Where their teachers are like, you're nothing but a, you're no good, you're never going to learn math. Who was the math mathematician that became so famous that had special needs? I don't know. Anyway, not for the back room. No, 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 no. Anyway, so what I'm saying is that this great reversal begins with the birth of Jesus. Even before he's out of the womb, he's already affecting the great reversal because God works best with the outcasts, the outlaws, and the outsiders. Now, the great reversal of power, or the reversal of fortunes, as some of you have heard it said, is both a literary device and a theological truth. So as a literary device, we have seen writers and um, novelists and all of them write about the fortune of someone who goes from rich to poor, or poor to rich, or famous to losing their reputation from somebody that nobody knows to famous. We've seen this, right? The great reversal of fortunes. Well, the great reversal of power is not by any writer. It only comes through the power of God. God is the one who ushers in the great reversal of power. So God is the one who brings it, and he uses the unlikely, the poor, the forgotten, and he lifts up the lonely, and he lifts up all of those people that the world would cast out. And I'm going to show you how he does this already in the Gospel of Luke, how he begins it. And you know why he does that? He does it so that the invisible becomes visible. The visible God, the invisible God becomes visible through the weakness of others. Because if we're the ones that the people think are the outcast and the outsiders and the outlaws and the people who, you know, the world has already cast aside because you're over the hill, right? God is the one who uses you. Then guess who gets the glory? God. God gets the glory, right? So the great reversal is already, it's still happening. It will be in its completion when Jesus returns. But until then, we as a society and as a church have to get used to people, including ourselves, that are a little odd, that are a little different, that are a little bit weak. 
I'm here to tell you we're not popular church people. We're not. Not the popular church. We're not filled with the beautiful people. What we're filled with are the weak, the odd, the peculiar, the older, the more mature, the seasoned, right? And guess who God uses? Those people. Those are the people that God uses to bring about his plan of salvation. It's amazing. That's what the Gospel of Luke's theme is, the great reversal of power. So now you've got a little trivia thing that you can use when someone asks you what's the Gospel of Luke all about. So God has always used people that are weak, people that are, you know, um, forgotten about. And in the Old Testament, there's a great example of it. It's the book of Esther. You know the book of Esther? Esther was a poor orphan. She was an orphan. Her mom and dad were dead. She was being raised by her uncle, Mordecai, right? And she's beautiful. She's beautiful. So Mordecai knows that she needs to do something. We need to do something because he's seeing the pressure on the Jewish people. Remember, this is Persia now that they're in, okay? Persia. Well, eventually, the king will let them some of the, some of the Israelites go back to their land, but not all of them, and he let them go in stages, you know, 70 years here, 70 years there. It's not like he said, okay, everybody's free to go. Let's have a party. No, because he's a king and he wants to rule over other cultures and other people. So here's Esther. She wins the beauty contest. Remember, they primp and do whatever, wax her and shave her and make her smell good and whatever. And it takes two weeks for this to happen. The king picks her. She becomes the queen of Persia. She informs the king that his henchman, Haman, which is his right-hand guy, is planning to destroy the Jewish people because, get this, Uncle Mordecai won't bow, bow down to Haman because Haman thinks he's a god. Yeah, there's a lot of people out there that think they're god. <laughs> we got a lot of people, rich and poor, that think they're god. You know, entitlement, all of that, yep, on either scale. They think they're god. We should bow down to them. So what happens? A great reversal of power. Haman is dethroned. The king's right-hand guy is beheaded with the guillotine that he built for Mordecai. Talk about your great reversal of power. And Mordecai gets his estate, and he gets to be the right-hand guy of the king. Isn't that cool? All because Esther was brave enough to speak up. And you say, well, it was Esther and Mordecai who did this. No, it wasn't. It was God, because God promised that there would always be a remnant of Israel, the Jewish people, because that's what he promised. Because salvation comes first through the Israelites, through the Jewish people. Jesus was Jewish, right? Comes through the Jewish people and then to the Gentiles. So there's no way, and, and really, genocide was going to be, he was going to, Haman's goal was to kill every Jewish person. Sound a little bit like Hitler? That's who Haman was like. You hate Hitler? Hate Haman, because that's how he was like, that was what he was like. And yet in that great reversal of power, using a poor orphan girl... And Mordecai, who refused to bow down to Haman, changed, changed this situation for the Jewish people. If all the Jewish people were gone, let me put it another way, there would be no Mary, there would be no Joseph. There would be no room to carry the Christ child. If all the Jewish people were, remember, God come from the line of David, did it? All of that? This great reversal of power was not done by Mordecai and Esther. It was done by God. So the great reversal of power in our world today, the way the great reversal of power works, the way the weak and the peculiar and the odd people um, are used by God is because of God, based on God's standards, not on human standards. This world lives too much on human standards, amen? Yeah. Everybody wants to have a great reputation. Why? I, I, I'm at that age now where someone says, you know what, I, don't, I just want people to like me. I'm like, why? Why should they like I got to love you in Christ. Of course I do. But I don't have to like you that much. <laughs> but I have to respect the fact that God uses everybody. Jesus came for all people. But yet we have this elitist idea in religion that some churches are better than others, some Kids are better than others, and they break apart this into these little cliques, and you do more harm than you do good. I want you to know that the great reversal of power <clears throat> started long ago. God was already using people, but Jesus is the kingdom of heaven, and he's going to usher it in at his birth. So let me get back to what I was doing. Hey, Ben, I don't know where I am. <laughs> uh, uh, bottom of page four. 
Oh, perfect. Okay. <laughs> so we're with, back with the Gospel of Luke and Mary. Okay, so we see this theological truth in the Gospel of Luke in Mary's beginning of Mary's song, where the reversal of fortunes or the reversal of power is underway. The birth of Jesus shows that God is in the process of bringing the world back to the order of God's terms. There was, there was no elite people in the garden. There was God, and there was creation, and they knew their place. Now we have people that think they are God, and that you are their inferiors. You're the subordinates. That's that's what we have. If you're popular, you're an you're an NBA star. You're great. You make millions and millions of dollars, and we make them rich. No offense, but we do. They wouldn't be rich if we didn't watch them. Now I'm all for the NBA. I'm all for watching sports. I love sports. I think it's great. But what I'm saying is, is that when you see a humble NBA star, you see God at work in their heart, don't you? That speaks more volumes than the NBA star who's in an accident because he was snorting coke. Because he can. Right? So this is what Mary says. This is what she knows to be true after she's been um, visited by the angels. She's become pregnant um, by the Holy Spirit. And she remembers what God's great arm has done in the past for the Israelites in Egypt. She says, God has performed mighty deeds with his arm, his right arm, his right arm, his strong right arm. I know my right from my left. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. How? How did he scatter the proud? By using a stuttering geriatric murderer named Moses. 80 years old, to bring the Israelites to freedom in the promised land. The promised land was a land in Cana, but it also represents the freedom we get when God in Christ came to forgive our sins. So God uses a stunning geriatric murder, Moses. He uses the weak to show his power. So what does that mean for us today? It means that God is still at work ushering in the great reversal of power, where those who think they are powerful and secure by human standards are not really powerful and secure by God's standards. So if you've ever thought yourself an outcast, an outlaw, an outsider, at times, you're just who God wants to use to bring continue his plan of salvation. Because there are people that don't know about Jesus there's people that have not heard about Jesus. There's people that have heard about Jesus, but they're so mad at God that there's no way they can accept Christ in their hearts. Oh, but they can when people like us, who might be a little weird, might be a little odd, might be a little peculiar, go up to them and tell our story. And they're like, yeah, if God can work through you, maybe he can work through me. Right? Right? So, how does God do this? How does God bring about the great reversal? First, God brings about the great reversal of power by using those the world thinks are past their prime. Right? Luke starts his gospel telling the story about how God used an old priest named Zechariah and a barren wife, Elizabeth, to birth John the Baptist. He's the forerunner to Christ who would prepare the people, get them ready for the salvation of the world to be born. So, this is what... It says about Zechariah and Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive. And they were both very old. Luke makes a point. And they were both very old. Theologians believe that they were somewhere between the age of 60 and 80. Even at 60 women, there ain't much going on. <laughs> right? <laughs> at 60, we are well past childbirthing years. Right? Well past it. Remember, Zechariah and Elizabeth were at a dead end. Without children in that time and in that culture, there was no legacy, no possibility of a future for this couple. But this is exactly where God works. God works in those places where it seems like it's a dead end, where it seems like it's impossible, where it seems like, what do you want to do with these old people? They're 80 years old. What are you going to do with them? Oh, I'm going to do a lot with them. I'm going to do a lot with them. Anybody feel put out the pasture? Anybody feel past their prime? God's not done with us yet. Did you notice I said us? Because I'm in there. God's not done with us yet, is he? No, he's not. 
So was being old the only qualification for Zechariah and Elizabeth? Nope. Luke states that they were righteous in the sight of God. Zechariah, by Mosaic law, could have divorced Elizabeth at any time because she was unable to carry a child. Did you know that? That was, that was a law. Even though it might have been the guy's issue, it didn't matter. They always blamed the woman. And so he could have divorced her. But he didn't. Do you know what he did? He prayed. He prayed. To Luke 1 13. But the angel said to Zechariah, Do not be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. Years and years later, your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you are to call him John. If you think you're too old and God can't use you anymore, pray, like Zechariah. Might take you 20 years. I, I'm just saying. Zechariah was young at one time, and he prayed. He was probably in his 20s, and he prayed. Till in his 30s, and his 40s, and his 50s. Even when it seemed impossible, he kept praying. He was righteous in God's eyes. He was blameless. He was a servant of God, even when those prayers weren't getting answered yet. But God had a plan, and it was a great reversal of power, and it was underway. Why do you think God uses older people in his plan? Because we got a few more years under our belt. Life experience, don't we? Mm -hmm. Yep. We've been around the block, as I like to say. We've been around the block, haven't we? A couple of times. Three times. Four times. We've seen how God has used some of our weakness <laughs> to make us stronger. Amen? We have grieved the loss of some of the things our bodies used to be able to do. <laughs> right? I used to be an aerobics instructor. I used to have to go every six months to uh, pass an ESPN fitness test with the ESPN guys and how they come, the, the fitness guys. And I mean, they were solid muscle. And <laughs> I had to pass a fitness test to be able to be an aerobics instructor. Now I walk up the stairs and I'm like, how? Oh. <laughs> What's happening? And I play pickleball on Sundays and then the next day I'm like, ow, oh, what happened? We grieved what our bodies can't do anymore, but you know what? God, we welcome in the things God is still doing with us. The new things God is having us do. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? What? We have got volunteers that are 65 plus. Most of the ministries we have around here are being done by 70 year olds. Amen? Amen. Are you 69 and holding? Yeah, right? holding. Boy, am I ever holding. <laughs> that's, who's, that's who's running this church. I mean, yeah. God will use those who the world thinks are past their prime. I mean, have you ever been dis, dis, uh, disrespected by younger people that just kind of, you're old. I'm going to go around her. My gosh, she's going to take forever to get a card at Sam. <laughs> right? And say, so, oh, can I help you with this? No. Nope. Get out of the way, lady. <laughs> Soccer moms. Go in. I used to be one of those. Now I'm like, ooh, I'm going to slow down a bit and enjoy my shopping. Listen to the new things that Zachariah, let's say he's 60. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt. He's 60. Okay? This is what Zechariah is looking forward to. This is what he prophesies about his son, John the Baptist. Luke 1, 76 and 77. And you, my child, he's talking about John the Baptist in Mama's belly, will be called a prophet of the Most High, a prophet for Jesus. For you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Our pasts are not to be disregarded, amen? Because our past experiences are the foundation for this church. Guess what? We're not the first ones that have been here. We're not, it's been here since 18 something. And all those faithful people, all those piano players that would play and there's only 10 people in the pew. All those faithful people that would try again with another Bible study when only two people showed up. Those faithful people. Those women who know how to make 180 scalloped potatoes for 180 people. I have no idea how you make that, Joanne. The funeral dinners are going to be horrible down the road. Me and Julie got to cook them. <laughs> Unless we know how to make meatloaf or monkey bread, we're in trouble. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Our past... 
That's why I love intergenerational churches. That's why I love each Sunday on the first Sunday of the month, our young kids stay up here because they get to experience the older generations, the grandmas, the many grandmas that they have and the many grandpas and, they, and the moms who are raising teenagers that want to pull their hair out of their head, right? Can talk to someone who's been through that. I've been through that. She's been through that. Gail is going through it. <laughs> a second time. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Here's a grandma who's helping to raise a teenager. So if any grandma and grandpas are out there that are helping to raise teenagers, there's a lady to talk to. And how new people that are getting married, your daughter's getting married, and now you're bringing in another family, how do you navigate that? There's people that are experienced through that. I can talk to them about that. So our pasts are important. And they're the very foundation and the existence of this church that will continue on and on and on. And there's something new that's happening. Something new that God will do with us who are considered past our prime. Number two, the second way God brings about the great reversal of power is using the young. So, got the older, now I've got the young. This is all in the Gospel of Luke. This is how he starts his Gospel out. It's amazing. Theologians agree that Mary was between the ages of 13 to 14 years old. That's usually when they got married is when they had their first menstrual cycle, they were ready to be married. Okay? And we know some girls it's a little bit younger, some girls it's a little bit older. So they're gauging between 13 and 14 years old. She was from a poor family. We know that because Mary and Joseph offered two turtle doves at their sacrifice, which is the cheapest animal you can offer to sacrifice. It's the most inexpensive. And we know that she lived in a culture where unyoung, unmarried young women had little value. Why do you suppose God would choose a young teenage handmaid to carry in her womb the living God? A young very young, okay? What age did Jesus die in, at? About 33, the theologians believe. So Mary would have been 46. Which means she, and old back then, was 60. That was old. They didn't have, they didn't have you know, cortisone shots. Mm -hmm. Amen to those, right? They didn't have, you know, new knees that they could give you. They didn't have any of that. God chose a young handmaid because she would be able to go all the way to the cross with Christ. She would be able to travel with him. She would be able to want to tell the stories to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about how when Jesus was 12, we couldn't find him. It was so frightening for me. And then we find him in the synagogue, or we find him in the temple. She's the one that's going to tell those stories. Guess who was at the foot of the cross? John, Mary, Mary, and another Mary. <laughs> They're the ones that are going to hear, and it's finished. I thirst. You know those last words from Jesus on the cross? Who do you think? Peter didn't hear him. Peter's gone. Peter ran away. Andrew ran away. It's the women that heard it, and John heard it. And everybody thinks, well, John probably wrote it. Yeah, John wrote it because if the women would have wrote it, nobody would have read it back then. So he uses a young teenager. Because he knows she will be able to live long enough to help share those stories and to see it through. God uses younger people because I think they're willing to uh, take more risk than some of us that have some years under our belts, right? Um, young people dream big. Don't they dream big? They're spontaneous. They come home after 12 hours of work and I'm like, oh my gosh, I just want to go to sleep. And they're tired, but they're like, let's go to Taco Bell. They go, or hey, let's go, uh, let's go play Dungeons and Dragons. Let's go tubing. Let's go do this. Where I'm like, all I want to do is crawl in my bed. They dream big. They think they're invincible, right? You remember when you thought you were invincible? Okay, back to the older days. Let's drag race down the road, right? Nothing's gonna happen. God uses the young people because they're the boys for us. That, yes, the past is important, it's the foundation, but they're also the ones that say, you know what, if you want young people in here, you really need to use X, Y, and Z. But we've never done that, but it, it's really good. Do you know when we were doing our online, um, just strictly online with COVID, and there was nobody in the pews, and we, you know, we would kind of gauge, you know, how many people were watching and how, how we were reaching them when the sermon was on. Um, do you know who reached more people than I did? Charlie. 
because he went onto his phone. He goes, hey, I'm going to be preaching at the church. Snapchat, Snapchat, Snapchat. Right? And there they were, boom, <laughs> watching. So what I'm saying is God uses the young because they dream big. <clears throat> if all we have is a goal right here and we've met it, we got to have goals way out here. And our young people are going to be able to bring those to us. And when we say, we tried that in the past, it didn't work, we have to be willing to listen to the younger people when they say, but maybe if we tweak it this way, it will. Amen? God uses the young. But here's the catch. Mary was a servant of God. Listen to what she says. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Unfortunately, many of our young people are more full of themselves than they are servants of God. I was, was 18 once. I know, it's unbelievable, isn't it? I was 21 once. I was thinking about how much money I could make. Not, how am I going to, you know, go to a potluck? What are you talking about? Bring toilet paper for some? Why? They can just go to the store and buy it. Dumb. You know what I mean? Didn't have enough life experience to understand that there were people in the world that didn't have toilet paper. So sometimes our young people are a little bit self-centered. Now, old people can be self-centered, too. Older people can be self-centered, too. But young people, you know, those are the ones that the world now, you know, your 30-year-olds are in the workforce. They are the ones that are kind of running the show. And what have we seen happening <laughs> up there? People are more selfish than they ever have been. Amen? Mary, 13 years old. I am a servant of the God Most High. Let it be so. Let it be so. When God calls you into ministry, you go. Now, it might take you a little bit because you just keep saying no. But we have less and less young people going into ministry. They can't find priests. They can't find pastors. Do you know why? It's a very humbling job. You ain't going to make six figures. Well, you might if you're Joel Osteen. <laughs> but if you're me, you're not going to. You're not in it for that. You're in it because you're following a call from God. Mary confirms God's work of the beginning of the great reversal with the birth of Christ. She says in verse 52, God has brought down rulers from their thrones, but have lifted up the humble. She is the humble servant of God. He lifts up the lowly. He lifts up the teenager who has no voice. Last, God brings about the great reversal of power by using the powerless. By using the powerless. In this chapter of Luke, chapters 1 and 2, the women are portrayed as the powerless. Women are not powerless. But in that culture, they made them powerless. Okay? Back then, that was the we have a lot of cultures around this world that make women powerless, make them wear what they tell them to wear. Right? Cover your head or we'll kill you. Right? So in this culture, back then, the women were powerless. At the time of Jesus' birth, they were oppressed. They had no voice. They could not learn Torah. They could not, they were not educated. By human standards, they were considered powerless back then. But again, God doesn't work with human standards, does he? God hears the cries of the oppressed, the lowly, the powerless. And you know what? The oppressed, the lowly, and the powerless have a tendency to be a little bit more open to hearing what God has to say to them. And seeing and experiencing God's work. Elizabeth knew God was at work in her life. Listen to how she prays after she finds out she is with child. Verse 25. The Lord has done this for me. She gives credit where credit is due. The Lord has done this for me. In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Back then if you were barren, you were a disgrace. Something's wrong with you and you must have sinned somehow. That's what they thought. She was an outcast. She was powerless as a woman. He could have divorced her and she would have been on her own. Elizabeth knows the Lord is the one who gave her the gift. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, when Mary walks into her door, this is what she says. This is incredible. In a loud voice, Elizabeth exclaims to Mary, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. Get this. 
But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Elizabeth, a barren, older woman who's disgraced by her community, powerless, is the first person to recognize Jesus as the Son of God before he's even born. Isn't that amazing? And this whole time ago, it was the woman at the well was the first preacher. But actually, it's Elizabeth. The Lord, why should I be so favored that the Lord has come to visit me? The Lord, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, she knows this to be true. And it is God who has done it for her. The birth of John the Baptist, by the way, the last prophet on earth. Because after Jesus is born and Jesus speaks, there are no more prophets. There are no more prophets to prophesy about the coming Messiah because he's here. There are no more prophets to talk about the kingdom of heaven and it's to come because it's here. Because here comes the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of heaven has come near. That's what Jesus said. I've come to preach the kingdom of heaven. I've come to usher in the great reversal of power, people. This is how I work. I don't work with the rich and famous. I work with the poor, the weak, the forgotten, those that have special needs, those whose backs don't work anymore, those who hurt their hips. Oh, can you come to sandwiches anyways? Yeah, I guess. I'll sit down and rest in between. That, that's where God works. That's how God works. Our job is to get used to God working that way. So when you see the misfit, when you see the person who's alone, when you see the kid that's sitting by themselves, that is who God wants you to work with. That is who God wants you to go out and spread the gospel to. Because God's going to do an amazing thing through them. The greatest reversal of power ever known that we can read in the Bible was the death and resurrection of Christ. Talk about a great reversal of power. Death had power. And after the resurrection of Christ, death wears your sting. We know where our loved ones are. We know where they are hanging out, having dinner. We know that they are surrounding us with prayer. They're praying for us. Go, little church, go. Go out and get those misfit toys. Go out and bring them in. Tell them about Jesus. Let them know that this is the arena God works in. This is where God works best. With those that have no power. With those that the world would say are weak. <clears throat> That is what the church needs to learn today. That God chooses to work in the world by lifting up the lowly. <clears throat> May we be inspired to look for those that the world has left behind. And may we introduce them to Jesus and watch what he does. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for a reminder that that's where you work best is with the lowly. You work best with those that are forgotten by the world, those that aren't famous, those that aren't rich, those that are average, unexpected, everyday living people. That's where you work best because then you get the glory. The great reversal of power continues today through the church and that is how we should work. So thank you for reminding of us, us of that today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to do communion. Jesus was to um, get hand sanitizer. <laughs> he didn't have that. He did. Maybe they washed with wine. Maybe they washed with hand sanitizer. Because that would kill everything, right? So after the night that Jesus, or after on the night that Jesus was going to give up his life for you and for me, the great reversal of power, by the way, he took bread, lifted it up to heaven, gave thanks to God for it. And then he took it, and he broke it, and he said to his disciples, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after the supper, he took the cup. Oh, I got many cups. 
And he lifted it up to heaven, and he gave thanks to God for it, and he told his disciples, Take, drink, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sin. Drink this, all of you, and remember what I've done for you. I work best in the arena of great reversal of power. If you think you're weak, if you think you're forgotten, if you think you're too old, if you think you can't do it, I will use you. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for being here with us and for reminding us that you work best with those who think they can't. So we thank you that you get all the credit, you get all the glory. And we ask, Lord, that this bread and this juice be the very body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Body of Christ broken for you. I'll serve you.
looked up a name and a category, health, surgery, cancer. So let's go ahead and take some prayers. Got somebody writing them down. Remember to write your prayers down too. Jean, or yeah, Jean. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all the prayers. Yes. The surgery went well. Everything went well with her surgery, so she thanks you for her prayers. Other prayers? Yeah. For, for her health and Cody's recovering good. Cody's she recovering good, so that's a joy. And joy's for health. Yep. Continued health. Back to work. Back to work, Cody's back to work. Yep, John. Michelle, she's got the crud. Michelle's got the crud. Okay, so for healing for Michelle, thank you. Other prayers? The military? Yep. And Ramona with cancer and... Our daughter Megan for personal. Megan for personal, thank you. Healing for Eric. Healing for Eric, yep. I have a praise. My um, two granddaughters and her dad and stepmom, they were in an accident this weekend in Detroit during that wonderful storm. Oh, during that nasty storm, yeah. Yeah, Valerie's banged up a little bit, but they're all okay. They're all okay, so continue what? healing for Valerie. Mallory. Mallory, sorry, Mallory. I knew that. And so for the rest of the family, a little shaken, but doing okay. So that's a praise. Vera's back home. Uh, praise that Vera's back home. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Leona. Continue prayers for Steve. Continue prayers for Steve with cancer. Thank you. In the back, Ellie. I'd like to thank everyone that sent me cards and calls me when I had an episode on the ice. <laughs> an episode on the ice. There's a lot of skating on the ice, you guys. Stop that. Mrs. Rice for cancer. Thank you. Yeah. Answer prayers for Pam, who had open heart surgery, and she's healing well, and yep. will be joining us again down at the Rock okay. this week. All right. So for Pam for healing, she's back to volunteering. For Carol Inman for healing, so that um, infection is getting better and the healing is taking place. It's been a long time, so um, she's uh, at home and loving it. Anything else? See ya. No, I just just. I'm very thankful we got the barn sold yesterday. Oh, you did? Okay. So I'm all cleaned up and ready to go. Yeah. Um, one of the centers bought it. Okay. One of the centers bought it? Okay. So for praise that they sold um, the farm, so that is a relief. So a joy for that. Sue. For my granddaughter, Izzy. Izzy? In a big school. She's 14 and just, she's 14. She's 14. And for baby <laughs> yeah. Quinn. For Quinn with the tumors. Yeah. Uh, Livia is 12 now. Lizzie's, Livia, Livia's 12. Yep, she had her birthday on Friday. Yay, happy birthday, Livia. <clears throat> Anything else? Yeah, Kelly. Safe travels for Brittany and back to Florida tomorrow. Okay, going back to Florida? I didn't know you were going to Florida. Have fun. <laughs> spring break. <laughs> oh, spring break, that's right. That's right. The up north colleges. And, well, actually, all the colleges for spring break. Anything else? All right, let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks for being with us and for being able to participate in communion, holy communion, where we know that the great reversal was taking place at your life, death, and resurrection, and your ascension, because the Holy Spirit came and empowered your people to go out and share the good news that you work best with weakness. So we thank you, Lord, that if we are feeling like an outcast, an outlaw and outsider that that is where you do your do your most amazing work because then you can get the credit so lord you've heard the prayers of your people there are many we pray for safe travels we thank you for those that um were protected in accidents down in detroit there was a lot of snow so i just thank you i know there was a lot of people on the road and we thank you for that we do thank you for those that are um, continuing to be healed in miraculous ways, Lord, and we give you all the credit for that. And Lord, we thank you for this place, this church, where we can continue to be the misfit toys that go out into the community and share your love. And then they will see you. Thank you, Jesus, also for teaching us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our offering plates are in the back along with our grateful giving jar. Please join me in praying for our offering. Lord, I pray that as we give you our offerings and tithes this morning, that we think about the fact that the tithe is yours. It belongs to you. May we never withhold what is yours. Please accept these offerings and tithes with gladness. Amen. Please enjoy us. Of power 
And Lord, if we've ever felt left out, we know that that is the best place for you to work. So let us share that good news today. In the name of Christ, amen. All right, head on down.